Our first representation will be to represent a set as an unordered sequence using the linked list class that we already created. So we're going to represent our set using a linked list, but we'll make sure that that linked list contains no duplicate items, no elements that were repeated. So we're building an abstraction here. We're going to define a function to tell us whether a set is empty, which is just to check that the S is an empty linked list. So this separates the use of a set from its representation as a linked list. We'll also define a function called setContains, which takes in a set, which is a linked list, and a value, and tells us whether that a value appears as an element in the sequence. So if I create a sequence and then I call setContains using one of the elements, such as 2, I'll get true. But if I called it on 4, I'd get false. Now, the implementation using recursion is straightforward. If it's empty, then element v is obviously not there because no elements are in an empty set. If the first element of s is v, then we've found the element we're looking for. Otherwise, we recursively call set contains on the rest of the list to see if we can find it there. Now, the time order of growth, or the number of operations required to execute these, is just constant for empty. For set contains, it depends on whether and where v appears in s. If it's right at the beginning, then it only takes one step in order to solve this problem. If it's at the end or not there at all, then you have to iterate through the entire thing, which means a different recursive call to set contains for every element in the linked list. We're going to call this theta n but making some assumptions to justify that claim. This is how long it takes to find v in s if v either doesn't appear in s or its location is a random location within s. As soon as we talk, start talking about random locations, what we're really saying is a claim about the expected amount of time it takes to run set contains, which is a probabilistic notion that you talk about a lot when you're dealing with algorithms. We won't go too deeply into that issue in this course, but it is worth noting that if you want to make a claim about the running time of an algorithm that might vary depending on its inputs, well, you may have to make some assumptions about how those inputs are structured. All that discussion is to say that this is a linear time process. We go through the elements of s until we find v. Let's write it out. We have our linked list class from previously. We're going to describe sets as linked lists with no repeats. How do we do that? Well, we define empty to just return whether s is link.empty. And then we define set contain which, as I said, takes in a set and a value. If s is empty, we return false. Otherwise, if s.first is b, we return true. And finally, we don't know whether it's true or false just by looking at the first element, so we have to recursively call set contains on the rest of the list using the same value we had before to see if it appears there. So the linked list implementation has additional functionality such as element selection and length, but all we're using here is the fact that it has an attribute first for the first element and rest for the rest of the list. So if I have a linked list, one, two, four, then it should be the case that calling set contains on s and 2 says true, or 1 says true, and 4 says true. But link 1 is false and 7 is false. Let's talk about the other set operations. Adjoining to a set. First has to check and make sure that that element isn't in the set, because we want to make sure that the set that we create by adjoining some set and some value doesn't have any repeats. So s won't have any repeats at the beginning, 
but we want to make sure that it doesn't have any repeats at the end. So we either return the set as it is, or we return the set with s and v in it as well. This is a theta n, or linear time operation, because it has to call set contains, which is linear time as well. This is constant time, just creates a linked list. Here, n is representing the size of the set. OK, what about set intersection? Well, here's an implementation. We'll take in two sets, set 1 and set 2. We'll define a function that tells us whether some value v is in set 2. And then we'll keep all the elements in set 1 if they're also in set 2. To do this, we first need to define a new version of keepIf that works for link instances, because the original version that we wrote just worked for built-in lists. And this is going to be a theta n squared operation. Why n squared? Well, for each element in S1, we have to check all of the elements in S2. This is an instance of nesting. Even though it doesn't look like two nested for loops or two nested while loops, we are doing a linear time operation for each element in a linear length. And so we multiply together those running times to get n times n or n squared, assuming the sets are the same size. Union set takes in set 1 and set 2, figures out a function not in set 2, which is the same thing as in set 2, but inverted. Then we find all the elements that are in set 1, but not in set 2 by keeping everything in set 1 that's not in set 2. Finally, we extend set 1 not set 2 and set 2. What does that do? Well, that builds a linked list that contains all the elements in this, followed by all the elements in this. Now, why so much work? Well, all this work is to make sure that we don't have any repeats. We want to make sure that we find all the things that we need to add under the front of set 2 that aren't already there that complete the union of the sets. And again, we'll need to define extend in a way that will work for our linked list class. Our old version only worked for the data abstraction. This is again a theta n squared operation. Why? Well, for the same reason as we had before, we're calling keep if on a set of length n using an operation that takes n time. Now, in addition, we're also doing some piece of work here by extending. This is a linear time operation. So you might think it's n squared plus n, but that's actually equivalent to theta n squared. The additional linear time operation here is a lower order term that gets removed when we express things in theta notation. OK, so let's implement all these things and see how it works. First, we have to finish our implementation of linked lists to include both extend some two linked lists into a longer linked list, which says that fs is link.empty. We just return t. Otherwise, we have to link together the first element of s with everything that you get by extending s.rest and t. We also need to define a version of keep if, which takes in some linked list s and a filter function. Now, before we wrote this with a list comprehension, and it was a one-liner. But now we have to think about linked lists and their recursive structure. So let's work on that by first saying if s is link.empty, then there's nothing to filter. Otherwise, we're going to keep around kept, which is going to be everything in s.rest that passed the filter function. What about the first element? Well, if it's the case that calling the filter function on s.first leaves us with a true value, then 
will return a linked list containing both s.first and everything that we kept from the rest. Otherwise, we drop s.first and just return kept. And we need to remember to return these values, of course. OK. So if I have some list and I extend it and itself, I'll get 213, 213, just repeating the elements. If I want to only keep the elements that are greater than 2, I'll be left with only 3. So we now have some additional linked list manipulation machinery. We can use that to define a join set, which takes s and v. If it's the case that s contains v, then adjoining just returns s. Otherwise, we need to link together v and s. What about intersect set s1 and set 2? Like I said before, we check and say if something's in set 2, which is a function, which takes in a value and returns whether it's the case that set 2 contains that value. Then we can return the result of keeping everything in set 1 that is also in set 2. And union looks similar. Let's just run a quick test to make sure this works. So I could have one set containing 2 and 4. I could have another set containing 1 and 5. If I intersect these sets, I'm left with nothing. But if I were to intersect s and the result of adjoining t and the number 2, well, now as t is going to be 1, 5, and 2 on the front, this will be 2 and 4. The intersection will have a 2 in it, and we'll have a representation of the intersection. So to be clear, this implementation is just a baseline to get started. There are more efficient ways of representing sets, and we'll work through those shortly. But at least now we have a fairly complete implementation that uses our linked list class in order to represent set containment, adjunction, intersection, and the empty set.